Tip. I'm Dr. Gloria Lattimore, Peace, host and producer of OmniU Presents the H3O Art of Life show. I am very happy in the studio today because I am doing a taping now with someone that I like to claim as a son, but of course he's outgrown that. I think he thinks of himself as something independent of that title. <laughs> but at any rate, I want you to know that Professor Joseph Ben Levy is in, in the house. And I want you also to know that I am so not in charge of this show because we are going to talk about the Temple of the African Community of Chicago, uh, which is held at the Jacob H. Carruthers Center for Inner City Studies on Oakwood Boulevard in Langley. We're going to talk about that because we're still doing our series on spiritual traditions and we're looking at the relationship between education and spirituality. And consequently, we want to be able to mention some traditions that may not be widely known. And so I want to greet you, Hotep, my son. Hotep, my mother. All right. <laughs> and uh, you may say as much about um, the founding of the Temple of the African Community of Chicago as, as you wish. And then, of course, talk to us about the subject at hand. Okay. Well, thank you very much. I'm glad to be here as always with you. And and I'm I'm always going to be your son. All right. Well, that, you're always going to be my mother. Know. That's nothing's going to change that. <laughs> <All right. laughs> but I do want to talk about the Temple of the African Community of Chicago. Um, Temple of the African Community of Chicago uh, was actually uh, started in February of uh, I want to say 1986 or ready to get my notes out here because I always have to have my notes with me. Yeah, it was actually formed in 1981. Mm -hmm. And uh, the purpose of the Temple of the African Community of Chicago is essentially to expose African people to um, the moral, moral and spiritual teachings and principles of ancient Kemet. Mm -hmm. Now, there are many, many types of temples that exist uh, around where people are professing to teach ancient Kemetic st studies. However, when you study the tradition of ancient Kemet, and you begin to realize that the temple as we know it, and this is true of temples in ancient, in antiquity all around, the temple was not a place where people went to worship, like right. going they to a church or something. they were usually too small. You couldn't yeah. even house a congregation. Couldn't house a congregation mm -hmm. in them. It was really something where priests went and performed their various types of ceremonies. Now, during particular processionals, there was a place, for example, in, in the Nile Valley in ancient Kemet where they had what they called, uh, there was a, a bird, a lapwing bird called the Rikedi bird. And people knew that when they saw the Riketti bird, that this is where they were supposed to stand mm -hmm. to watch the procession go by. Mm -hmm. And so, but, but they, didn't ha they weren't able to go into the temple and sit and listen to a performance or something like that. So there's several things that involved in uh, the establishment of the, of the temple. And uh, one of them, of course, was to teach traditional Kemetic values and structure and liturgy using ancient Kemetic text. And in the temple, of course, we have a priesthood, and we also have other functions, just like they had in ancient Kemet. You had your priesthood, you had uh, people who handled the food, people who did the singing, and so forth and so on. And we meet every first Sunday of the month, and we meet, actually, we used to meet at the Center for Inner City Studies. Now we meet at the Masonic Temple, the Prince Hall Masonic Temple on 42nd and uh, Cottage Grove. Mm -hmm. And we meet there every first Sunday from uh, about three to about five. So it's not like something we do every um, every Sunday or something like that. 
But as a part of that, we also have different rituals that are performed that were traditional rituals that were performed like the Feast of the Valley, which happens uh, in June around the time of the summer solstice. And what we also call the the uh, Mesure or the New Year celebration, which happens around September because that was the beginning of the new year in the Nile Valley. And we also perform um, weddings, funerals. Uh, we have initiation ceremonies for people who go into elderhood or into the various stages of, of life. Um, we also have uh, every first Sunday, uh, we have what we call uh, spiritual development classes where um, we actually have people come in and learn the various texts and we get a better understanding of the text, break them down, say in the original and so forth, so that people can understand what's going on. We have a board of directors. Uh, that handles all of the uh, nuts, and bolts. nuts and bolts functions of the, of the to the administrative tasks and so forth. We have a brotherhood, have a sisterhood. Uh, we do a lot of community outreach because people have always are asking us to perform different types of ceremonies. Um, and we have several principles. And I want to read the, the ten principles of African spirituality that we uh, use throughout the service and each one of these principles are followed every month that we have a uh, temple service. And the first one is the recognition of the one creative spirit of the universe, Amen or the hidden one. That's very important because we need to have an understanding that there's on one, only one creative principle, one spiritual fundamental elemental principle throughout the entire universe. That principle in ancient uh, Egypt and in Medunetcher, the ancient language of ancient Egypt was called Amen. Amen was considered the hidden, the unknown. No one knew what Amen was. No one could explain what Amen was. No one knew what Amen looked like, but Amen was the, was the spiritual principle that made all other spiritual principles exist throughout the entire universe. Uh, the second one is the recognition of the infinite manifestation of spirit that inhabits all things in everything that exists. And so we as African people, we understand that spirit exists in everything. That spirit is not something remote from us, but it is something that is within us, it goes through us, and it inculcates everything that exists in this earth and in the universe. You know, the stars follow a pattern. The sun rises and sets like it's supposed to. The moon rises and sets like it's supposed to. It goes through its various phases. So all of these things are very much a part of the fundamental spiritual principle. And all these things came into existence through the hidden or the unknown one. We can't explain who the hidden or the unknown one was. So the name Amen does not mean that that is the name of that thing. That is the name that the ancient Kemites described what they could not describe. You know, it's, it's, I, I like to get a comparison um, from the biblical standpoint of the creator. The creator in the Bible described as Yehoah, that is sometimes mistranslated as Yahweh and Jehovah, but pronounced Yehoah. Yehoah literally means it that exists. What is it? We don't know what it is, but it exists. And it made everything that exists in the earth manifest itself. Now, the same thing in Kemet. In Kemet, the aspects of Amen are broken down into various forms. You have a creative principle called Ta. You have the principle of water called Noon. All these things are various forms of what comes forth from Amen. Well, some might say, well, okay, but that's, you know, that's, 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 that's talking some type of uh, idolatrous stuff. Well, it's not because when we read in the Bible, in the first chapter of what they call Genesis, in the first verse, it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Well, that word God, the Hebrew word Elohim, means forces. These are all things that Yahweh created to do the work of Yahweh. So these, all these Elohims, all these forces, they, in, they inhabit everything that exists out there in the world. Everything that exists on, in the heavens and in the earth. The sun is a L. The moon is an L. Plants are a part of the L. Human beings are part of the L. We have people who even took on that, that, that aspect of their name, like, uh, like Elijah, which is pronounced Eliyahu. Eli, which means 
my force, my power is Yah, Yahoo, Yahoo, Eliyahu. All right. So all these the, these things are not different from anything that that world saw anyway, because that was the world that they lived in. They understood that even fundamentally, just like in, in ancient Kemet, they had the first trinity of Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Well, among the people who lived in ancient Palestine, they had El, Baal, Asherah. This was their trinity. El being the father deity, you had Asherah or Ashtaroth who was the mother deity, and you had Baal who was the son deity. All right, just like we had with uh, Osiris, the father, Isis, the mother, and Horus. You see, and unfortunately, most of the people fail to, fail to realize that like in Catholicism and in Latin, they say in the nombre de Padre, de Fili, de Spiritu Sante. All right, the Padre is the father. All right, uh, uh, the Fili is the son. And the Spiritu Sante, the Holy Spirit, is the mother. But of course, in, in Christianity, because they took the mother image out of everything at a certain point in time, which is now a lot of research is coming back to recognize again the power of the mother, the power of the idea of, of the person called Mary. Because anybody who's been in Catholic school knows that uh, oftentimes you have to recite what they call the uh, uh, um, Hail Mary. The Hail Mary. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord, Lord is with, with thee. thee. Blessed art thou among women, women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, womb Jesus. Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray, pray for us sinners now, now and at the hour of our death. death. Amen. All right? So that they used to recognize <coughs> at a time the power of the mother image and that imagery, and, and, and that stayed for a long time. But oftentimes when we're looking at this, we've been so conditioned to extract it from its foundation that we tend to miss it because we've been taught to think of, uh, of, uh, of, of what I like to call the Cartesian view of man and mind and that these things, two <coughs> things are separate when in fact in the classical world they were one thing, they were not two different things. So that was important that that, that spirit manifests itself in all things and the recognition of the spirituality of all African people. In other words, while the, the Temple of the African Community of Chicago uh, teaches the liturgy of ancient Kemet, we have people that come to the temple who have different views, Hebrew Israelites, Yoruba people, uh, uh, people who practice the Yoruba belief set of Muslims. It doesn't matter because we recognize the spirituality of all African people so that the temple is open to anybody of African descent. And so and, and, and we ask people to, you know, come by, check it out, see what it's all about. And uh, to realize it's not something where you join or you got to go through some special initiation or something like that. This is something free to African people. This is something we miss. Too often in our, in our spiritual practices, you have to be a part of something. You have to join something. We're not saying that you can't participate in things, but if you don't, you don't, and it's not a big, a big deal. We just encourage people to come and to share in the knowledge with us. And pro probably in the process of you sharing, you, you'll gain some things and a greater understanding of spirituality to realize that spirit encompasses something a lot greater than uh, something that's in a building. As I always like to say, if the spirit that I'm involved in worshiping has to be confined in a building, that's not a spirit I want to be involved with because spirituality is something much greater than any building and spirituality is not the same as religion. Spirituality is higher than religion. Religion is something, the, the, the Latin word uh, regulare literally means to, to tie. tie or to bind yeah. up, you know? And so we're not trying to tie anybody up or bind anybody to anything, you know, versus some of the traditional uh, 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 Western religions where you are, you have to go through a process of being to be a part of something, starting to realize that even in some of these things, like in Christianity, when you get baptized, this is a part of a ritual, a cleansing ritual, where you are literally born again through this ritual cleansing. Well, they were doing this in ancient Kemet a long, long, long time ago, before they were even doing it there. This is a very common process of ritually cleansing yourself. So when one, once, one, once one comes up out of the water, one is born again in their spirit within themselves so that that tells you something about where the spirit is the spirit is within you the spirit is not out there like the the uh the early gnostics who were actually african christians that most people don't want to talk about. a lot been being talked about the gnostics now but people, most people fail to realize that what they call gnosticism is really a group of ideas and and uh uh 
thinking that was that evolved out of a group of Africans who existed in the Nile Valley, and that thinking was very different. I always like to use the example of uh, of uh, of the, the text they call the Gospel of Thomas, which has been very it's been popularized a lot. And of course, people find out about the Gospel of Judas and the Gospel of Mary Magdalene, and uh, it's particularly the Gospel of Philip, where 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 uh, it was complained that. Uh, to, to Jesus by, by Peter that, you know, why did he kiss her in the mouth? And he said, well, did I love all of y'all? I could kiss you all in the mouth like that. And they're like, how you dare say that Jesus kissed a woman? But she was his companion. And in those days when somebody was your companion, that was just more than just your friend. And she was his special companion and she was considered the apostle of the apostles in that she knew more than all of the others did. And you got to remember that they were the ones who punked out on him and ran if, in fact, the, the resurrection thing actually took place. But the people who were standing there were the women. Mary, his mother, the other Mary, and Mary, his companion. Those were the people who were standing there with him when the whole thing went down, and they were the ones who were with him all the time. There were lots of, and lots of women involved in that movement back then because in antiquity, in African society, we didn't see a problem with women playing a role because we understood that in terms of divinity, you couldn't have a male child or a female child without having a relationship with a woman. You couldn't have a father and a son and not have a woman to make the son come into existence. Whereas traditionally we've been taught that that didn't exist, but then, you, you know, and we don't have a lot of time to go into the history of how these ideas came about, how they developed the Nicene Creed, uh, the various versions of it, and, and the discussions that went on under at, at the Council of Nicaea when 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 uh, uh, Constantine actually essentially called together all of the bishops from around his kingdom and to decide on some of these what they call theological questions. The Africans did not agree that Jesus was the Son of God. They said, they argued that this was a spiritual thing. This was a spiritual entity, not a real individual. But what he did with them and told them, he said to them, look, since he didn't have a clue as to what they were talking about and could have cared less, but he told them, and, this, and anybody who wants to check it out can study it, he said, look, why don't you all sign on to this thing? And after you're done, not only... Can you stay at the palace? You invited to the party too that I'm gonna have after all of this. All right, so not only did some of them sign on, like uh, uh, Eusebius, the Bishop of Caesarea, and Eusebius, the Bishop of, of Nicomedia, and, uh, and, and, and even Arius, but who Arius, excuse me, didn't sign on. He was like, I'm not dealing with that. Well, the people who didn't sign on to the agreement were kicked out, they were excommunicated. Those who did sign on among the Africans when they, after the party was over, and they had did whatever they did at his party. When they got back to Africa, they wrote him letters saying, you know, we shouldn't have ever signed on to that. But it, the, the, the die was cast by then. It was too late. So, so the whole story came out. But when we're talking about African spirituality, we're talking about going beyond those political things that have created various dogmas and doctrines. We're talking about something much greater than that because African spirituality can be, can be practiced anywhere. You'd be walking the street you know, and practice spirituality. You could be in your, your bathroom, in your tub, wherever you are, and you can practice spirituality. That's, that's, that's not, it, spirituality is something that you, you do. It's not something that you, it's, it's not a, a special set of necessarily rituals. Of course, the priests used to do special rituals and things like that to acknowledge the importance of the deity, but these were all things that they did as uh, again, rituals, they were symbolic things that they did. They were not real things that they did. I mean, you know, you didn't, uh, when the priest became purified, and, and in fact, the very word in, in Medu nature for priest means purified, one who is purified, one who is pure, all right? It didn't mean that you were, quote, pure, pure, but you were definitely ritually pure. You know, the priests could wear sandals. The vast majority of the population didn't wear sandals. They didn't wear sandals because they couldn't wear sandals. They didn't wear sandals by choice. And it was a symbol among the priests that they did wear sandals. But there were other people who wore sandals. But most of the people didn't wear sandals because they didn't, you know, it was a kind of a thing that nobody was like, what, everybody here wear shoes. All right, most people wear shoes at least. All right, they felt that some people didn't wear shoes. They didn't have to wear shoes. So the next thing was, the fourth principle is that the recognition of the essential harmony among spirit, cosmos, nature, and African people, and that we are part of a continuum, a whole, that makes up this universe. That there's no separation 
between the cosmos, you, between the, the, the celestial and the terrestrial. There's no difference between the cosmos and what's down here on earth because we are all connected. We're all a part of the whole. Whereas traditionally, in most traditional religious systems, you are separated from what is supreme because it's out there and you're down here. And you can only get to that once you leave here. Well, of course, uh, some, some of the fundamental ideas that go into that, of course, come from Dante Allegri in the Inferno. You know, because people think if they don't do this thing, they're going to go to hell. Uh, Thomas Aquinas came up with the idea of purgatory, where you're kind of in the middle and you don't quite know where you're going to go, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and, uh, and then we have Paradise Lost by Milton, which talks more about the idea of hell. But we got to understand that the people who wrote this literature were living in a time when they were living in hell. And they thought about hell. And many, many, many of them were thinking in terms of, 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 the, 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 what, what they call in Greek the parousia. The parousia means the, the, the arrival, the return, or what they, what they traditionally define as the second coming of Christ. They perceived that this thing was going to come. That, is, that has been so much a part of the development of Western civilization, it's, 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 it's unbelievable. I mean, most people talk, think about the pilgrims coming here, you know, with some, with some, with some shiny black shoes on, with buckles on them, and some shiny black hats, with some buckles on the top of them, which is nothing like in, in time nor space the way they looked. They were walking around in their breeches, which was their drawers, and they were dirty and nasty and filthy. And if it wasn't for the Native Americans, they wouldn't have known how to do it. But they came here because they perceived this as the new Jerusalem. They came here perceiving that they were going to usher in the second coming of Christ. And many, many, many movements throughout Europe were geared toward this, the second coming of Christ. And they found people to be the Antichrist. You know, when the pilgrims came here, they saw the Native Americans as the Antichrist. That's why they went out to kill a lot of them. Because as long as they were here, the Antichrist was here. That was the devil. How could you have the kingdom of God? established here that you establish and not that God is established, but you establishing this and and you got the Antichrist amongst you. So they pick Antichrist and they did this throughout history many, 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 many times. The Hutterites and, and, and other groups of them all came up with this idea of trying to find the Antichrist because they were believing that the, that the end of the world was about to come. They thought the end of the world was going to be in 1611. And then, of course, you had the Millerites, out of which the Seven Day of Venice and the Jehovah's Witnesses came, who thought it was going to happen about 18, uh, 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 1834 or 1833. When it didn't happen then, they changed the date. And when it didn't happen then, they changed their story. And so, and, and, and the exact same thing happened when uh, the year 999 came along, that happened in the year, uh, in the, rather in the year 1999, happened in the year 999. In the year 999, they also thought the world was going to come into a, to an end and Jesus was going to return with the second coming. Now, in ancient African thought, we don't have none of this kind of stuff, all right? But it didn't happen. So since, the, since it didn't happen naturally according to them, then at, in the year 1000, the church began to perceive of an idea of how they could bring about the kingdom of God. Since God didn't do it, then men were going to do it. So then when everybody was talking about it, as we approached the year 999, and then when, quote, the second coming in occurred in 999, since it didn't happen then, what did people do? They changed their story. So what they, the way they changed their story is not everybody talking prosperity ministry. How are you going to talk prosperity ministry about a man who lived in the Galilee, which was the worst place in all the land of Israel, which the poorest place in all the land of Israel, who's supposed to have talked to the poor, not to the rich, and didn't talk about them being rich. But... All, you know, everybody's talking, you know, a lot of ministers are talking prosperity ministry. Now, how can we get rich? That has nothing to do, but then that's what happened when you, get your, when you don't know your history and the story don't turn out like you're supposed well, to be. Well, you don't you know the your, secret. That's right. The secret is that you just use the law of attraction and you just set your mind on something and it comes to you and yeah. then you get rich. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But then, but, but, but they're telling, what, what they like to tell people is that if you believe in Jesus, then, you know, you are, this will help you toward getting rich and using all these little formulas and stuff like that, which was the furthest thing from that man's mind if, he, in fact, he even existed. And, of course, there's evidence that he did. So those types of issues are there. And so the fifth principle is the establishment of, of comedic liturgy uh, and a calendar for spiritual wisdom. So, we've, so a part of that is understanding the nature of the comedic calendar and its cycles and so forth and using the comedic text. Uh, just had your last guest here. They were talking about the Shabbat stone, uh, and uh, and there are many, many other texts uh, that that are available. Now, some might say, "Well, why should I read those texts? Because that's just nothing but a bunch of idolatrous stuff." Well, why are you reading the biblical text? Most people don't even know how this stuff came into existence. Most people don't know how the New Testament was actually put together. 
the text that were put together to make the text that has come to be recognized as the New Testament. And same thing is in many cases true with what they call the Old Testament, even though, as I like to tell people all the time, nowhere in the Old Testament is it called the Old Testament, nowhere in the New Testament is it ever called the New Testament. All right. But these texts were put together. How were the, the so-called Gospels organized and, 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 and when was that decided and why was it decided and, and how we see how many of these texts, particularly we talk about the New Testament, didn't come into existence to us in some cases 300 years after the event. Now, I always tell people, now imagine yourself, we're having this conversation and then somebody is going to tell this same conversation we're having right now 300 years from now. And that's supposed to be the exact same conversation unadulterated that we're having right here, right now. That's, that's, that's not even real in time or space. But that's what people believe. Because belief is a powerful thing. You know, the Greek word pistis means, you know, that they translate as faith mean belief. You know, you can believe in lies. But that, that belief has no knowledge base to it. So at least in terms of the, of, of, the, of the comedic literature, there's a solid knowledge base that goes along with this because we can track this knowledge base back thousands of years. And many of those texts are still here that were in existence thousands of years ago. All right, so uh, also that, um, that the use of the comedic text is the major repository of this spiritual wisdom and because that, there's a lot of wisdom there. There's the wisdom of Tahotep. Tahotep, for example, is, 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 is speaking to, you know, the, the, the person he's passing down, this is his children he's passing down, this wisdom down to when he's saying, I'm an old man now, I can't hear. I, you know, it bothers me when I get up to walk. You know, uh, my sight is going. He says, but understand that you can learn wisdom even from the women who are down there washing their clothes on the grinding stone because no one is born wise. Right? Or you had a, a, the text of Duaketi. Duaketi, which they call the satire of the trades, but Duaketi, here he is, he's, he's taking his son to the scribal school. And he's teaching, telling his son on the way, it's like when you take your child off to college and you're giving them final instructions. He's giving his child the final instructions about uh, the importance of being a scribe, going to school, learning how to write paying attention, don't do the wrong things in school else you're going to get yourself in trouble and how important it is to get an education so that you can be a scribe so you don't, and then he goes down and he lists all of the other types of professions that exist in the now value it's like you don't want to be any of those, you don't want to be the bricklayer look at the brick, the guy who, who, who makes bricks his leaves are stiff all the time, he, he looks like mud, he's dirty all the time you don't want to be a fisherman because the fisherman stinks of fish all the time all right? so you want to be a scribe because the scribe is his own master. The scribe stands before great people and stuff like that. And, and, and just speaking of the fish, you know, in early times in Christianity, the fish was the earliest symbol, not the cross. But what most people don't know is that the fish, the, the first symbol of the fish you found at the, at the monastery of, of a person they call St. Pacomius. Now, Pacomius was an ancient Egyptian who was the founder of the monastic movement. And the symbol of the fish was there, but the symbol of the fish goes back to ancient Kemet. Because in ancient Kemet, the fish, which they described as Inet, was a symbol of a place where the soul was hidden. So you'll see on a lot of tomb paintings where you have a man with a spear spearing into the water to get at the fish. Well, this is an idea of trying to capture the soul that has gone by. And so the, the symbol of the fish was a symbol of the soul. Long before the cross, the cross is a symbol of death. All right, and anybody who knows anything about the history of Rome know that the Romans would put people on crosses and they would hang them for as far as the eye can see and then at night light them on fire. That's what Nero did so that you could see your way. All right, so the next thing, the eighth principle is the conducting of celebrations for the incorporation of children into the African community, initiation of youth into manhood and womanhood, the union of families for the purpose of creating new families, the investment of mature men and women into positions of responsibility, the advancement of elders to the state of veneration, and the passage of the deceased to the state of everlasting life. So these are all kind of things that we do because this is all a part of traditional African culture and society that you made sure that children understand who are elders over them and when you got to be a certain age that you became an elder and the responsibilities of being an elder and then when you pass on that somebody sends you off properly. All right. the, the ninth uh, one is the instruction of African people in, in Kemite spiritual, ethical and moral values with special attention to the children and the youth because we feel that it's important that children and youth understand various ethical and moral values you, you, so that they'll know the right way to go. I mean, the very word in Greek ethics for ethics, ethike, literally means uh, to have character. And ethike arete literally means to have excellent character. So it's about 
having excellent character. And if, if children are learn, learn to have excellent character, then they'll learn that certain things you don't say around elders, certain things you don't do around elders, and a certain respect that you give to elders when you're around them. Right? And, 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 when, and when I mean elder, if you're 12 or 13, your elder is somebody that's 30. You know, when you're 30, your elder is somebody who's 40, 50, and even 60 or 70, and so forth and so on. And that has to be understood. The, the other thing is promoting, the tenth one is promoting African familyhood as the foundation and exemplary model of, of national life. Because without family, you have no nation. Pretty straightforward. The eleventh is promoting African nationalism among African people as a natural component of, the Africans, of African spirituality and as a duty among all African people. In that, uh, we try to teach people and have them understand that it is important that you have a sense of your Africanness. And, and what we mean by Africanness is, while uh, I may not have been born in Africa, Africa was born in me. That's what that's all about. That doesn't mean that, you know, everybody's going to jump up and leave and go to Africa, because that takes us in the debate that went down between uh, Frederick Douglass and Martin Delaney. Martin Delaney was all about a search for a place, to find a place for all black people in America to go back to Africa. Frederick Douglass was like, no, we're going to stay here. Of course, the American Colonization Society, most people failed to realize they thought was all for emancipation. No, they were for emancipation, but they were also for the emancipating us all the way up out of here. It was like, thank you very much. You've done your service. Now, guess what? Let's send you all back. All right? And there were some people who said, we're not going back. You know, we helped build this thing. You know, we expect to get some rights here for this. So African nationalism was very important, the whole idea that we are an African people. The idea of Pan-Africanism, that all people of African descent are African people as one and as a whole. And of course, everybody doesn't understand that and everybody doesn't buy to that. Just because a person is from Africa don't mean that they understand Pan-Africanism because many of them have been brought up under the colonial society in Africa. So some of them think while they might live in, in, in a country where the French colonized Africa, many of them are more French than the French. You got some who are... Uh, uh, who live in East Africa that was colonized by the English, by the British, who are more British than the British. Just like we got black people in America who are more American than the Americans, even though Kravko, when he was reading, writing in the 1780s, in, in his article, What is an American, said, asked, when he asked the question, what is an American, he said, an American is a European or the descendant of a European. So I, you know, I asked our audience, when you think about that, think about what it means to be an American, whatever that is. You know, we still haven't figured that out yet, you know. And then, uh, the twelfth thing is promoting the development of a healthy African personality through committing spirituality, ethics, and morals. So the whole idea of spirituality, ethics, and morals permeates everything that exists in terms of the ideas of the Temple of the African Community of Chicago and what we have been promoting since 1981. I have to take you back to a couple of them. One of them, you said, you, I think you just, you've been in imbued in this for so long that you don't realize that when you said union of families that would not have been understood by people who are not em embracing African culture. Union of family is marriage. Yes. It's yes. not marriage of individuals. No, it's, it definitely is and marriage. And why is that, why are we dealing with union of families as opposed to union uniting two individuals. All right, very good point. Because in African society, as we started out talking about the nature of deity, that you couldn't have a male deity without a female deity. You couldn't have all males. This is not like Hesiod talked about in the Theogony, mm -hmm. <laughs> where, mm -hmm. where you had the gods of silver, mm -hmm. the gods of gold, and the gods mm -hmm. of bronze. They mm -hmm. were all men. Mm -hmm. and, and, and as we see in, uh, in, in uh, um, in Works and Days by Hesiod, mm -hmm. that when the woman shows up, mm -hmm. she is trouble. Right. She has brought trouble mm -hmm. in the world. They, you know, he call her a name, I'm not gonna call her here, but that mm -hmm. is Hesiod's word mm -hmm. that people use to describe women today. Mm -hmm. All right, that is, you know, and, and we're talking about Pandora. When Pandora showed up, well, well in, in, the, in the mind of the, of, 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 of the Greeks, it was, it, was a, it was a man's world. Mm -hmm. you, know, uh, you know, I think about all the people who went and saw uh, the, the, the Battle of Thermopylae, right? Mm -hmm. What they call the 300, mm -hmm. when, when the Spartans fought against the, the Persians. Well, very few people have studied the Spartans. Mm -hmm. Now, you want to read some strange guys. The Spartans, they used to take young boys when they were very young to start training them. And they would have homosexual relationships with these young boys mm -hmm. and raise them up. This is a part of that. That, that, that culture that they had. Mm -hmm. The Roman Emperor Hadrian, Hadrian 
almost lost his man and, 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 and pretty much committed suicide because his young male lover died in the Nile, drowned in the Nile, and he just lost his mind. Couldn't think of what to, think of what to do. Uh, uh, Heliogobalus, one of the other emperors of Rome, used to walk around and drag all the time. And of course, we know about uh, 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 Gaius Caesar, who's real, who, who we know by the nickname of Caligula, a little boots, and the type of personality he was, because you know he would, he, you know, Caligula would, would would have a party, invite senators into the party with their wives, and then tell the senator, "Look, I'm going to take your wife, wife back in the back, and I'm going to sleep with her." And then come out after he did it and tell everybody, including the husband, what the relationship he was he had with his wife. So these types of things, this is not what we're talking about. We're talking about having real marriages between men and women so that we could have families based on the African principle and the way a family is supposed to be. Of course, I realize some out there will say, well, you know, you know, what would you know? But I'm talking about African spirituality. I'm not talking about Judeo, Judeo, uh, 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 what we might call Western civilization or Greco-Roman notions of family, all right, where women didn't have any rights whatsoever. They could knock them in the head. They could kill them. It didn't matter. Uh, if, if you read, I was talking about Constantine. If you read the history of Constantine, Constantine boiled his wife in, in scalding hot water when she was taking a bath and killed her. Killed his brother, too. All right, he was eliminating, and his son, eliminating all opposition just because he could do that, because that was kind of a custom. All right, so these types of things are very, very common. So when we talk about family, we're talking about men and women getting married and establishing family. That's what we mean. Okay. That's what we mean. And we also talking about individuals don't marry, the family marries the other family. Yes. Yes. Individuals definitely never get married. When people, when people marry, what happens is that f essentially two clans are coming together as one. All right. Two clans are coming together. I don't use the term tribes because we've been caught up in thinking that people had tribes. You know, you don't have 20 million people and have a tribe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when we talk about various uh, 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 national groups in, 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 on the continent of Africa, you're talking about millions of people together. You can't have a tribe there. You know, you have a tribe when you might have a couple of hundred, a couple of thousand people. You know, among the Romans, like Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar realized, and it was, and it was almost a, a rule among the Roman consuls, that they had to eliminate at least 5,000 people. So their whole people that Julius Caesar wiped out, that, you know, these people no longer exist on the map of the earth today. All right, so, so those, but those are tribes. Those are tribes. You know, we're talking about various nations of people, and 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 that is the as as a distinction uh, that that uh, is between what we're talking about when we talk about marrying, because we're not just marrying individuals. We're talking about marrying families, mm -hmm. and the two families come together. Mm -hmm. And once that happens, that's a that's a kind of a connection that never breaks. And even if you end up being separated mm -hmm. and get another family, you still had that other family. Mm -hmm. there. All right. And that doesn't mean that always that all families are going to get together. In Kimmy, they all families didn't get together, even though they were firm believers in Ma'at and the whole idea of universal order. They like things being in order. And amongst them, it was very, very important that people got together. And even if, the, you know, while, while women had a lot of freedom and if they didn't want to be with a particular person, they could leave him. But once they decided to get married and be together, people expected them to be together. Mm -hmm. All right. And, and there was no you know, fuss about that, but there was a certain universal order. Just as the, the deities were together, so humans had to be together. The earth had to, everything had a natural order and everything had to follow that order. That was what Ma'at was all about. It was about balance. You can't have balance if you don't have a man and a woman, a male and a female. That's, you know, otherwise you have imbalance. The consequences of imbalance is that your world gets out of order. And to the ancient Chemites, that just was just unthinkable. That's Once your chaos. world, it was chaos. Once your world went out of balance, that was basically it. That was the end of the that that was the end of your civilization, the end of your nation, and everything. And so they were really, really strong about that whole idea of not having trouble in terms of uh, of the the order that they should have in their society. And then the other part. Uh, the other issue or practice has to do with initiating uh, the deceased into eternity. I, 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 I pause to, to recognize that our colleague, uh, Roosevelt Roberts, 
has joined the ancestors and his services will be held by the time this is aired. Yes. But a part of his services will be will be the initiation into into eternity. Eternity. Right. Talk about bit about that. Well, the the, the ceremony of this the service the initiation into eternity when we come together as a, a group and we you know unlike in a I guess in a traditional funeral in, in Judeo Christianity we say certain things that are important that, that are appropriate for from comedic text mm -hmm. to prepare the person to lead them on the way because we realize that when the person goes into eternity uh, as we like to say we don't think of it as death mm -hmm. all right but a person moving on to another stage of life mm -hmm. and so we prepare this person uh, for this process of course in, to get the difference all right in the Nile Valley what they used to do which we don't do is they would prepare the body Mm -hmm. by uh, taking out uh, uh, certain of the key organs, uh, removing the brain through the nostrils, but keeping the heart, mm -hmm. because the heart was the seat of intelligence. They would dry the body out with, with natron or salt, uh, and then after this period, this period was done for say, 70 days, then they would have the priest come in, and in fact, priests whose specialty was doing this. And, and of course, we get the whole practice of, 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 of the funerary practices, from ancient Kemet, you know, in terms of of, of um, uh, preparing the person for the dead. I hesitate to say mummification because in ancient Kemet they didn't have mummies. Mummy is a relatively new term that came up in the Middle Ages because people thought that they could crush up mummies and they would get um, a special, you know, you could take you some mummia and you, it would make you feel better or something like that. You know, it was like, you know, people selling snake oil. Mm -hmm. kind of thing that was happening in Europe, but in ancient Kemet it was a much much more serious type of event where the person was actually prepared and they were wrapped up and certain things were given to them. We do this sometimes. We'll sometimes leave something in the hands of the, the person uh, uh, that's, that's, that's in the coffin. Or um, uh, they would do the same thing. They would leave uh, amulets. And for each amulet they would say a special prayer for that amulet. These amulets were to, were to protect the person as they journey through the next life. And we sort of try to do some of these very similar things to protect the person. Well, we know about this because, you know, in, in, in Christianity, they talk about the person going through the judgment. Mm -hmm. Well, the judgment scene in ancient Kemet had already been established long ago. And, and, the, and the journey through the underworld, what the Dante and them are talking about when you're going through this, this whole process and all of these things are attacking you, but you have to be protected from these things. This is the whole process they talked about in a text they called the Amduat, all right, or the, or, the, or the journey through what we might, what we can best describe as the underworld. But these amulets were all placed on them to protect them and to preserve them as they went through. And then they, they had what they called a... Um, a, a book of the Declaration of Innocence. The book of the Declaration of Innocence says, as the person is going through, that they have not. The negative confessions? Yeah, what they call the negative confessions are really called the Declarations of Innocence right. because they're, they're considered negative mm -hmm. because, well, let me get a little history of it. Mm -hmm. History of it. Uh, E.A. Wallace Budge, um, when he stole the papyrus of Ani mm -hmm. from Kemet. What he did was uh, when he translated it, he realized that it was what he perceived in his mind to be very much like the idea of resurrection. And so he called the text the Book of the Dead. Mm -hmm. And because the um, declarations of innocence that he saw looked very much like what is called the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. even though as I have said many times, there's no such thing in the Bible as the Ten Commandments, mm -hmm. because it never says, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, give them the Ten Commandments, it never mm -hmm. says that, mm -hmm. all right? Uh, but he, he called them negative because in the sentences defining these declarations of innocence, it, it, these declarations of innocence, it uses the, the, the negation form, which is not. And so it says, I have not told lies. Mm -hmm. I have not 
slept with my neighbor's wife. Mm -hmm. I have not mm -hmm. done falsely with the gods. Mm -hmm. It's different from thou shalt not, mm -hmm. all right, which is very, very different. Mm -hmm. All right, so, so he said that they were negative confessions when in fact they're not negative confessions. The person is merely saying, I haven't done any of these things. Mm -hmm. So they're declarations of innocence. And so he called it the book of the dead when mm -hmm. it is really called in, in Medunetia the Peret Imheru, which means the book of the coming forth by day. Mm -hmm. So this is the preparation to go into the light, as it were. Mm -hmm. People talk about going into the light. This is the preparation to go into the light. And if he passes through all these stages, then he is, uh, his heart is weighed against a feather. Mm -hmm. All right, the feather is the symbol of my eye. Mm -hmm. Now, if you think about the power of a feather, all right, and the significance of a feather as a symbol of how light and how pure your heart should be in comparison to your heart when you're wearing it out, that's a powerful statement. It's a powerful symbol. If you, if, if, if you don't balance out, then you get ate up by this animal that looks like a, you know, got the mouth of a crocodile mm -hmm. and part lion and part mm -hmm. hippopotamus, you know, mm -hmm. which, uh, uh, which is a bad thing, all right? Because first off, the, the, the now crocodile was a dangerous animal. And the, the, and, and the hippo, as much as we like the happy hippo, is a hippo is a dangerous animal. And the, 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 but the hippo is also a symbol of representing motherhood because hippopotami are very protective of their young. So it was also a symbol for that. But if you pass through all of that, then you would go, you would be led uh, by, um, as, as Jehudi, what they call, what the Greeks call Thoth. All right, but it's really pronounced Jehudi, who is the who is the principle of writing, uh, mathematics, um, science, and so forth. Then you'll be taken before the 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 the, the deity of regeneration, or what or Osiris. Osiris is oftentimes depicted in two ways: one is green, and one is black. You don't often see a lot of the black. Osiris. They don't always like it. See, I've even seen images of, of Amun, the hidden the unknown, in black. Well, to me, that makes a lot of sense because when we look at the universe in its primal form, it is black out there. All right? But also in green as a sign of regeneration, all right? And, and rebirth and regrowth. And so after that's done, the person t moves on to live forever. And so the book of the coming forth by day, as it's properly called, um, was was a part of this process, and if and if you could afford one, then the scribes who had responsibility to doing that would write you up. It was kind of a, it was almost like a will, you know. They had a standard form, and if you could afford one, they put your name in there, and they roll it up, they put it in your coffin with you, and that would prepare you as you go on your way, so that when you when it came time to the, for the judgment, you could hand this over and show that you hadn't done any of all these things. Those people who couldn't afford to do that, they got buried in the sand. All right, and there are many, many examples even to this day of, 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 of tombs that have been found that are of people buried in the sand in the fetus position. Now why in the fetal position? Because we come into the world in the fetal position. And so there, there's, there's, there's this kind of idea of birth, growth, generation, and the cycle continues again, just like with the sun. All right, so this was something that they always done. We, we get the, 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 uh, the riddle of the Cyclops from that. You know, the riddle of the Cyclops, which says, what goes on all fours in the daytime on, all, on two legs at noon and on three legs at dusk? And that's, a, that's man. Because you come into the world on four legs, you know, because you're on your knees and your hands. Then as you grow older, you stand up right. But then when you get older in the twilight of your life, you're on three legs because you have your cane to walk with. All right. So that comes from that very idea. So when we read it, a lot of times when we're reading uh, classical Greek literature without a knowledge of comedic literature, we won't even know where the very concepts come from. You know, we see this later on. Uh, there are many, many examples of, 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 of Roman and Greek text, Greek text where they use in the book of the coming forth by day. But they're speaking of it from the standpoint of a mystery. 
or what they call the mystery systems. Well, all they're doing is they're just re react, reenacting the ideas of the Nile Valley in these more modern forms. But the, but, the, but the interesting thing is that we can, get, we can go all the, up, all the way up to as far as, say, 349 of the Common Era, and we still see these things being practiced. The, the exact same way. And mind you, this is a period of time, right? This is a period of time when we have a significant number of people whom we would describe today as Nubians living in Egypt. All right? Not that they weren't always there, but I mean, for now we see them everywhere, going all the way back to, you know, what they like to call the 25th dynasty, what we like to call the rule of the, of, of the high priest of Amun, many of whom were women. Many of whom, not only many of, many of whom were women, but all of whom, whom were women from what we call ancient Nubia. Now, the word Nubia itself is a new word, not an old word. Nubia is the last definition of the history of that civilization. Nubia comes from a word Nebu, which means gold, because lots and lots of gold deposits were found there. And I bring up Nubia because... Um, Right now, there's a whole movement in the southern Sudan. Not to, you know, everybody's been focusing on the, the situation in the Darfur, and that's very, very terrible, even though down in the Sud area, which is very, very fertile, there's nothing going on down there. And this is where the Dinka live, right? Nothing, nothing is going on down there. But, um, but they're, they're in the process now, the, um, I believe it's the French, along with, uh, I think, the Japanese, and I could be wrong on that, they're building a, a new dam. This new dam is going to be 20 miles wide and some 100 miles long. And when they build this dam and create the lake that's going to be produced out of that dam, out of, from the dam, which is 20 miles wide and 100 miles long, literally thousands and thousands of years of ancient Nile Valley civilization are going to be wiped out forever. That means that this is, this is like taking history and 10, 15 years from now, nobody ever knowing that anything ever existed there when there's lots and lots and lots of stuff there. Because this civilization, which, which has foundations for what we call ancient Egypt or ancient Kemet, um, had been in existence, we're talking about going back to the year 9,000 before the Common Era. 9,000 years before the Common Era. And we saw that if way back then that there were civilizations out in Sahara, and uh, in the in the uh, and in the uh, eastern desert, what they call the Wadi Hamamat, which is by the Red Sea, um, and and another place called Napta Playa, which was out in what they call the Sahara today, where civilization migrated from there to bring about what we call uh, ancient Egyptian civilization, which actually started in what today would be described as Nubia, what they geographically they described as Nubia at the first cataract near the city of Aswan, and. All the way down there, we've had civilization continuous for, you know, all the way up until the time of the British occupation. Because after Nubian civilization was finally destroyed, you know, most people think of Nubian civilization as the 25th dynasty. Because they like to say that only the 25th dynasty is where the blacks were. And I brought some, some examples right quick because I know our time is short and I want to show some examples of what existed here. This is a picture from the tomb of Hui, who was um, a kind of a, a ruler, a big time guy in Kush, what they call Kush or Nubia. From, this is from his tomb. And as you can see from this picture of these Nubians, there's you know, some black, some brown, some all kind of colors, right? So that a very, very common picture. Now. If we look on the next page, we got at the bottom, right here, this is from the tomb of Seti I. So you see the Egyptians and uh, to, your, to, uh, to your left, my right, and then you have the people from Palestine, then you have the Nubians, and then you have the Libyans. All right, right there. Then at the top here, if I can get the picture right there at the top, all right, this is from the tomb of Kimset. So all these people, there are lots and lots of examples of people who were, who were people that we would say today were black people. Nobody would think of them as Egyptians because we think of Egypt today as the people over there who are Arabs who didn't get there until 639 AD. 
all right, and who are pushing what they're pushing. Now, I want to show this. You can see if I can focus in on this right here. This is a book right here that deals with uh, one of the pharaohs. The book is called The, the Nubian Pharaohs, all right? This is a, a picture of Pharaoh Taharqa. Now, just recently, this year, an excavation was done by the French, and what was found was a grave with all of these broken up statues of various Nubian pharaohs, all right, that was hidden, obviously, for protection. They were broken up and they were hidden there for protection. But what we have out of this is an entire picture of Nubian rulers that we knew by name, but now we know by face too. All right. Here's a good example, one right here. All right. And there are many, many of them, and, and you know, we're not going to all the names of them and everything, but Nubian civilization is very important as a foundation for the study of ancient Kemetic civilization. It's very, very important. Um, they were, the, the, for example, the name Candace, all right, or Kandeke as it's properly called. This was the name of the women who were the rulers in Nubia, but they were just not queens as sometimes it's written in books. They were pharaohs. They were actually pharaohs and rulers. Just recently, uh, 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 this week, they found a, 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 the mummy of of uh, Pharaoh Hatshepsut, one of the women who they recognize as one of the pharaohs. They just found her mummy. So there's so much to still be learned about this place. It's incredible, especially the area that they call Nubia, which again was a, a late term, term before then, as we see in the biblical days, it was called Cush. I like to say that because I, I just recently discovered that young people call marijuana Cush. And I was like, if that's not a miscarriage and a disservice <laughs> to our history, I don't know what is. Mm -hmm. All right, Kush was an actual great kingdom in Africa, one of the oldest kingdoms that exists in Africa. But before that, it was called Wawat, and before that, it was called Yam. So these are all important things for us to know. So when people talk about my Nubian sister, my Nubian brother, you know, you need to know some history about Nubia to know the significance of these people, the greatness of their civilization, that in Nubia, for example, the place uh, in, in one of the places in, in, in Napata, they have a mountain that they call the Holy Mountain, or, or, or what they call Juwa, the Holy Mountain, the place that the Arabs call Jebel Barkal, which is the place that they said is the seat of Amun. Now, that's interesting. Now, if Amun is the hidden and the unknown one, and the place that is the seat of Amun is all the way in Nubia, way down there in the Sudan, that's saying something. They're saying that their image, even in ancient Kemet, of their concept of deity, of the supreme deity, started out among some Africans way down, way, way down in the now. Are you going to be down. able to come back? Yes. I, because, you know, you just you done stepped off into something too deep, and we don't have <laughs> right. the time to explore it. Right. It's, it's I, al it always is short. I, I'm know, so much, so, you know, time is always short. You, know, you know, that makes, that makes a lot of sense about things happening in the Sudan. Mm -hmm. And so the, you have made a connection that needs to be followed. And I would invite you to come back and continue this discussion. Well, you know my mother. Anytime you want me back, all you got to do is call, and there I will be. I will be calling. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay, Hotep. 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 <laughs> Once upon a time.